but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. And no think of the blood this morning and the power that is in his blood there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilt and shame aren't you glad that um, not only are your sins forgiven but he says removes all guilt and shame um, the writer in the book of Hebrews says that he has cleansed us from a guilty conscience. And I don't know, this is for somebody today, um, but if there's something in the past that you just cannot receive his full forgiveness for, I want to encourage you this morning, stop looking at the past and sins, mistakes, 
that you made in the past and recognize that they are covered by the blood of Jesus for all of eternity. And he has cleansed us from a guilty conscience, refused to live in a place that he has freed you from and delivered you from. Well, this morning we're picking up in John chapter 7, and it's about six months time would have lapsed between the events that took place in chapter 6 and, and those that now take place in chapter 7. The reason we know that is because in chapter 6, it speaks of the Passover feast. And um, this event that's taking place in chapter 7 now is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And it was about six months that separated these two celebrations uh, for the nation of Israel, the instructions of how they were to participate in this festival or this feast are given in Leviticus chapter 23. It was called the Feast of Tabernacles, and it was one of the seven uh, feasts or, or celebrations that God had commanded Israel to participate and follow in. It was one of three uh, uh feasts that were that was required that every male Jew, if they were able, would attend, would go to Jerusalem and participate in this feast. And it has great significance. Um, the Feast of Tabernacles was a reminder to the children of Israel of God's provision for them, first of all, his deliverance for them from captivity in Egypt and his bringing them to the promised land and how for 40 years God took care of them and God provided for them every single day their needs. And so God wanted them to remember that time and very significant to them. You know, we're, we're often reminded that we're to remind ourselves. Does that make sense? Uh, I find in Scripture there are a lot of repeated things and repeated themes. And I think one of the reasons God has done that is because we need to be daily reminded of these things. Um, I often think of my own personal salvation experience, and it's good for me to share my testimony with me. Uh, last night, I was laying in bed and thinking of, of how God had saved me and how God had saved my wife. And man, it was just it was just so refreshing to say to me again, to me, my gospel story, how God drew me. So today, take some time and remember how God drew you and he saved you and reflect back on that. It's a necessary thing, I think, for us to be reminded of that daily. Um, but here in this Feast of Tabernacles, the Jews would travel to Jerusalem and the first day of the feast began on a Sabbath. That would have been from sundown on Friday to, uh, to sundown on Saturday. And it closed eight days later on the Sabbath as well. And I think there's significance here that that God had, had was pointing out that that day of rest. And for the Feast of Tabernacles, most scholars believe that it is symbolic or represents in that sense of when Jesus will return and establish his kingdom here on earth, uh, that will enter into that, that period of rest with him. And when the Jews would come to Jerusalem, they would build tabernacles, uh, uh, temporary dwellings all up on the hills, uh, mountains that surround Jerusalem, and they were tabernacle uh, for that entire eight days or that entire feast, uh, setting aside all regular comforts of their home and be like camping out somewhere for the week. And uh, it was a reminder of God's daily provision for them. Some believe, uh, many scholars believe, that it was actually during this time of the year that Jesus was actually born. We celebrate Christmas in December, uh, but there's good evidence to show that, that Jesus was actually born sometime around in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, which would have been during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. It would commemorated uh, the, the final harvest of the year, and it took place sometime between the middle of September, September the 15th through, through October the 15th. It was to be participated in beginning the 15th day of that Hebrew calendar of the seventh month, which is very different from our calendar. One of the evidences that is given oftentimes to support this idea that Jesus was actually born uh, during this time of tabernacle were the specific words that John uses in his gospel. Remember in John chapter one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and the Word 
dwelt among us. That same word that's translated dwelt is the same Greek word that's translated in other places for to, uh, tabernacle. And so Jesus came to tabernacle among us. Now, whether or not that's true or not, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure that it's very significant. Uh, however, we know that he came and he made his dwelling among us. So here it says, uh, beginning in the seventh chapter, the first few verses, Jesus' brothers are trying to get him to go up with him to Judea. He was in Galilee to celebrate um, this Feast of Tabernacles. And Jesus had said that, uh, that he wasn't going to go. He told his brothers, you leave and you go. Now, John records for us in here in verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. And so what was their reason for wanting him to go? Maybe to tout him a little bit, maybe to try to get him to come out and publicly proclaim the claims that he was making throughout all of Galilee. But nevertheless, Jesus said, you go up. And then he tells him in verse 6 that his time had not yet come, but your time is always here. What does he mean when my time has not come? My time has not come for me to publicly reveal that I am the Messiah. And all of his miracles that he was performing, the teachings that he was teaching would have lended to or given evidence that he was the Messiah, the sent one of God, but it was not time yet for his pronouncement. And then he says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to the feast for my time has not yet fully come. The world cannot hate you, he tells his brothers. Why can't the world hate them? because they are of the world. And um, it, it's interesting, as Dr. Williams pointed out yesterday, that, uh, that because we are Christ followers, because we are believers, just as Jesus said, the world hated him and it's gonna hate us as well. Now, he's talking about the world system and the world system is evil, it is fallen, it's depraved. And we should never imagine that we can correct the world system. It just will not happen. Uh, there, are, uh, there are many believe that believe that, that the church is to, is to become so purified that we have an impact in the world and the culture that it changes and we usher in the kingdom of God. Listen, that's just not gonna happen. That's an amillennialist view. And there's no way that this world, this world system can be changed uh, by that manner. It's going to require the return of Jesus and the judgment, that final day of judgment. And so we look forward to that day when Christ will return again and he'll establish his kingdom. So here Jesus says to his brothers, you're of this world. It can't hate you. Uh, and saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone on up to Jerusalem, uh, he, he decided uh, to go not publicly, but privately. And there were many of the Jews, there was talk around Jerusalem. You can imagine there were, there were tons of Jews in Jerusalem at this time because it was one of the required feasts. And a lot of the buzz going around was about Jesus. Where is he? Why doesn't he show himself? But it says that he had gone up privately so as not to, uh, to be public in this. Um, now, about the middle of the feast, verse 14, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man who has no learning when he has never studied, uh, how can he speak these things when he, when he has, has never gone to a formal rabbinical school? He has no formal education. How is it he speaks these marvelous things? Where do they come from? And it's interesting to note that Jesus would have gone to the temple there to teach. Obviously, because there were so many that would be packed into that temple area during that time, it's recorded that there were so many Jews that would come to the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles that, that there were so many sacrifices that, made, that were made. It took 24 divisions of the priests just to keep up with all the sacrifices that were being made. And so here Jesus proclaims in verse 16, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God 
or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of man, of him who sent him, is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? And so here Jesus is just pointing out that his words that he's speaking are not his own words. You see, the one that, that wants to express their own opinion, their own views of things, they're seeking to speak that for their own glory. But Jesus says, look, the words that I'm speaking are from the Father, and my desire is to give the Father glory. He sent me that I might reflect him. And then he kind of nails them and says, uh, has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? One cried out in the, in, the, in the crowd, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? And Jesus answered, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the Father, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath the man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be pro broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man whole, do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. Now here, what Jesus is making reference to is when he healed the lame man at the pool that was waiting for the waters to be stirred up. And the Jews, the Pharisees, were not upset in the fact that he healed this man, but they were upset that he healed him on the Sabbath. They had accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath. And you have to remember some of the things we've spoken of, how the Jews held to the Sabbath in that sense. But Jesus points out to them, listen, you try not to break the command of Moses, and if it falls on the day that is a, a little Jewish boy is to be circumcised according to the law, even if it's on the Sabbath, you will go ahead and circumcise them. And what Jesus is pointing out is their inconsistency in their man-made laws. And we do the same thing today. We have our own man-made laws and traditions, yet we violate the laws and the commands of God in order to hold to some of our man-made traditions. Just as they were guilty, we too can be guilty of that today. The one thing that we need to hold to, the one thing that we can put our security in, our banking in, is the Word of God and not man-made traditions. If there's a man-made tradition that you're holding on to today, I would encourage you to let it go. And by all means, don't try to impose a view of your own tradition onto somebody else. That's the sin that the Pharisees were committing. You see, they were, they were heaping these burdens on people that were man-made traditions that God had never commanded them to do. Examine your life today. Is there a man-made tradition that you're trying to follow and you're heaping this, this, this load that you cannot carry? My encouragement to you would be this, as Jesus said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We'll pray and ask God for an opportunity today that God would give you that opportunity, be intentional and aware, seeking the purpose to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart. And if a seed has been planted, ask God to give you the wisdom to cultivate that seed, to help turn that soil over so that God may, by his grace, save somebody today and he'd use you and me in that process. Well, I pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you. Uh, I'll be traveling to Nashville today, going up for a week for my week of banjo fun and relaxation. I'm really praying that I can disconnect this week, but I do plan on being with you every morning for devotions, and Lord willing, uh, Ben Clark, Banjo Ben Clark, will join me in those devotions in the morning. So have a blessed day. I pray the Lord keeps you. His face will shine upon you. I love you. See you tomorrow morning, Lord willing.